want you to hit me as hard as you can. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's Who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Hello, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're taking a look at 16 Candles, the 1984 coming-of-age comedy about a girl's sweet 16th birthday that becomes anything but sweet as she suffers from every embarrassment possible. They fucking forgot my birthday. Following the success of Mr. Mom, which we covered in our last video, Hughes made the leap from writing to directing, with 16 Candles being his directorial debut and the first in his series of iconic teen movies a subgenre that he essentially invented. This film really kicked the door wide open for Hughes' directing career, giving us some memorable teen characters along with some major 80s slang. Geek. Way to go, dickface. She had a hissy. Real smooth. Oh, uh, don't spaz out of Mike thinks I'm a dork. Don't have a cow. I've never bagged a babe. Hughes was known for chain smoking and blaring music while writing, and wrote the entire 16 Candle screenplay over a single 4th of July weekend. Now, before we continue further, we'd like to thank you for watching John Hughes Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, like this video, please subscribe to our channel right now, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. After seeing her headshot, Hughes cast then-unknown Molly Ringwald in the lead role. Reportedly, Hughes was so inspired by Ringwald's appearance, he put the headshot up over his desk and wrote the film with her specifically in mind for Samantha. Before Ringwald was cast, she almost lost the part of Samantha Baker to Ali Sheedy, her future co-star in The Breakfast Club. Laura Dern and Robin Wright also auditioned for the role of Sam. Anthony Michael Hall plays Ted Farmer, or Farmer Ted. I'm not really a farmer or simply the geek. Hughes wrote the role of Ted Farmer specifically for Hall as well, after having been impressed by his work on National Lampoon's Vacation. Jim Carrey and Keith Coogan also auditioned for the role. Hughes claimed every single kid who came in to read for the part did the whole stereotyped high school nerd thing. You know, thick glasses, ballpoint pens in the pocket, white socks. But when Michael came in, he played it straight, like a real human being. I knew right at that moment that I'd found my geek. Initially, Ringwald and Hall disliked each other, so Hughes took them to a record store and they bonded after they found out that they liked the same music. One of the groups they both liked was the Rave Ups, which Ringwald scribbled onto Samantha's notebook. Even though Sam ends up with Jake at the end, Ringwald and Anthony Michael Hall actually dated briefly in real life, between this film and The Breakfast Club. The role of Jake Ryan came down to Michael Schofling and Viggo Mortensen. Mortensen really caught Ringwald's attention. She told Axis Hollywood that she really wanted him. He made her weak in the knees. Oh my. In the end, the filmmakers went with Michael Schofling. Apparently, Schofling was so shy during his audition, it almost cost him the job. What? Producer Michelle Manning said he was so stunning and dreamy that we cast him. Carlin Glenn, who plays Samantha's mom Brenda, confronted Hughes about the fact that the script didn't call for her to apologize for forgetting her daughter's birthday, despite the fact that her character was described as a good and attentive mother. Hughes agreed, and added the scene where Brenda tearfully apologizes to Sam. Paul Dooley plays Samantha's dad. Initially, he turned it down since he felt it was a stock dad character without much development. Hughes called Dooley personally and told him that he wrote a scene with his and Ringwald's characters, which became an iconic moment in the film. Later on, Dooley said he'd have viewers tell him that they wished that he were their father based on that scene alone. Good. Get my money for it. Also, in that very same scene, the original script ended with the heart-to-heart -heart by having the dad ask his daughter what exactly happened to her underwear, which she gave to Ted Farmer. <sighs> Molly Ringwald's mother rightfully pointed out that it was weird for a girl's father to ask that. Hughes agreed that yes, it was creepy, and changed the line. Thank you, Mama Ringwald. Haveline Morris plays Caroline, the rowdy drunk party girl who also vies for Jake's affections. In real life, Morris is actually a natural redhead, but Hughes only wanted one redhead in the film, so she had to wear a wig for the duration of shooting. Getty Watanabe plays Long Duck Dawn, an Asian foreign exchange student whose character has been the subject of much scrutiny. 
His accent isn't real. I love a visiting with a grandma and a grandpa. As Watanabe imitated the accent of his South Korean friend. The actor eventually admitted to Hughes that the accent wasn't real, as he was actually from Utah. While he was worried about being fired over this, Hughes simply laughed at the realization. I've never been so happy in my whole life. <laughs> Watanabe would go on to play Ling in the animated Mulan movie. He also starred in Ron Howard's Gung Ho with Michael Keaton, Mr. Mom himself. Brian Doyle Murray, a frequent Hughes collaborator, plays the Reverend. Brother and sister John and Joan Cusack appear briefly. John plays Bryce, one of Ted's geeky friends, and Joan is the geeky girl yeah. who has trouble drinking water from the fountain. Out of the main cast, the only two actors who were actually teens were Ringwald and Hall, while everyone else was well into their 20s. As is tradition with most of Hughes' films, 16 Candles was filmed primarily in and around the Chicago North Shore communities during the summer of 1983. Molly Ringwald was allowed to decorate Sam's bedroom with items from her own to make it feel as authentic as possible. The costume designer, Mark Peterson, begged Ringwall not to wear the hat she wore in the first act. Ringwall insisted, and after the movie was released, teen girls started wearing their hats tilted back like that. Sam's room was a set built inside the high school gym, which is where they filmed the dance sequence too. The dress that Sam wears to the dance was supposed to be worn by Leanne Curtis, who plays Randy, but when Molly Ringwald saw it, she asked to wear it instead. They didn't have enough money to air condition the gym, so it was over 100 degrees during filming. It was so hot that Havely Morris changed dresses between takes due to all the sweat. Morris also didn't want to film the shower scene because the point was that she had bigger breasts than Sam and Randy, which she didn't in real life. So they had a more well-endowed body double for her playing a, a high schooler in the shower. According to the book, You Couldn't Ignore Me If You Tried by Susanna Gora, Ringwald stated that because she and Anthony Michael Hall were too young to entertain themselves at bars or nightclubs, they often spent their weekends off from filming, crashing the bar and bat mitzvah receptions that were held at the hotel in Illinois where the cast was staying for the shoot. During the scene at the dinner table, many of the younger cast members can be seen trying to hold back laughter or smiles. This was because, while filming, Watanabe was doing things off camera while reading his lines. According to Ringwald, one of the things he would do was stick grapes up his nostrils. Apparently, there's also a deleted scene where Long Duck Dong sings at the dance. Samantha's dad's car has the license plate V58, which stands for Vacation 58, a story written by John Hughes. Jake Ryan's Porsche also had the plate number 21850 for Hughes' birthday of February 18th, 1950. Oddly enough, Ringwald's birthday is also February 18th. The Rolls Royce that Jake lends to Ted to take Caroline home was owned by a friend of Hughes' father. Just goes to show you're never too old to ask to borrow your parents' friend's car. The cafeteria scene is only included in the televised broadcast and was never in the theatrical version, nor on the VHS or DVD versions. There's another cut scene with Long Duck Dong and his girlfriend going to a drive-in restaurant and causing a bit of trouble. These scenes were later cut, but it explains why there's a tray on the side of Grandpa's car. While Rudy's father explains his business activities to the bakers, the song playing in the background is the love theme from The Godfather. I dabble a little bit in personal loans and politics. When Sam sees her grandparents for the first time, the theme from The Twilight Zone plays. Where are my blue socks, Dorothy? You mean to tell me you didn't pack them? Oh, not again, Howard. And when Ted is walking up the bus aisle to sit next to Sam, the theme from Dragnet plays. The film was released on May 4th, 1984, and in its opening weekend, it grossed just shy of $4.5 million, ranking second behind Break It. It was a modest hit during its theatrical run, but blew up when it was released on VHS. Ringwald and Hall were both only 16 years old when the movie was released. The original soundtrack was released as a specially priced mini album containing only five songs, which is a bit of a bummer considering that the movie itself features an extensive selection of over 30 tracks. Hughes loves to include the Beatles as Ted Farmer sings Birthday to Sam in the auto shop. You say 
it's your birthday. It's my birthday too. Don't do me that, okay? Jimmy Iovine, the future co-founder and head of Interscope Records, was the film's music supervisor. Like other films around this time, the VHS releases, TV broadcasts, and the initial DVD release changed the majority of the soundtrack. Hate that rock and roll rubbish. Thankfully, the 2003 DVD and Blu-ray release restored the original theatrical soundtrack as intended by Hughes. Well, I'm afraid it's here to stay, Howie. That same year, USA Network announced a made-for-TV sequel called 32 Candles, showcasing the characters 16 years after the original film. At the time, it was unknown if any of the original cast would be involved, but that was unimportant as the film never came to fruition. And over the years, Molly Ringwald had expressed interest in a sequel, but after rejecting various pitches, Ringwald said in 2005 that she read a 32 Candles script that resonated with her, likely the USA Network's version. By 2008, Ringwald was campaigning for a sequel to be produced, but she was uncomfortable doing the film without Hugh's involvement, who at that point was uninterested in the idea. Sadly, Hugh's death in 2009 has surely put talks of a sequel to bed. Based on the amount of criticism this film has received both when it was originally released and retrospectively, it's fair to consider this as Hugh's most controversial film. Shit, I got Carol in the bedroom right now, passed out cold. I could violate her ten different ways if I wanted to. A lot of the criticism has been focused on the character of, you guessed it, Long Duck Dong for being an offensive stereotype of Asian people, up there with Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's. At the time of its release, Roger Ebert defended Watanabe's performance, writing that the actor elevates his role from a potentially offensive stereotype to high comedy. Watanabe also claims the gong sound effect wasn't included in the script, saying he thinks the gong was something they added. Somebody must have had a few beers. When Ringwald was asked about the character during a 2010 interview, she defended Hughes by saying that comedy can be cruel and why political correctness is important in many instances, it would be pretty much the death of comedy if it were taken to the extreme. However, by 2018, she had changed her mind on this as she became more aware of the negative effect of the character and how it impacted Asian Americans. She now perceives the character as insensitive, saying that the character is a grotesque stereotype, as other writers have detailed far more eloquently than I could. <laughs> Why, you little scuzzbag! Wow! In addition, Ringwald was extremely uncomfortable with some sexually charged scenes, especially the sequence where Ted takes photos of an unconscious drunk girl when he takes her home after a party. But she also noted that Morris, who played the role, told her that she wasn't bothered by the scene. And while I don't disagree with those points, I think it's unfair to judge this film by contemporary standards since it was clearly a product of its time. Controversy aside, of all the films Molly Ringwald made with John Hughes, she said she had the most fun on 16 Candles. In the end, I award 16 Candles 3.5 Molly Ringwalds out of 5. So what do we learn from this beloved comedy classic? Just be your best self. If it's meant to be, circumstances will work out and everything will just fall into place. See you next time.